All right, so we're gonna get started. So thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Today we're gonna be hearing from John Vandermeer, an Asa Gray Distinguished Professor in EEB. So John typically gives the first lunch seminar of the semester, but he rescheduled his talk due to the graduate student union strike earlier in the semester, which I think really speaks to his dedication to approach science with a strong moral compass. John and his lab group are extremely prolific and diverse in their research. They cover topics including forest ecology, tropical agroecology, theoretical ecology, and sustainable food systems. His talk today is titled Community Ecology as a Collection of Coupled Oscillators. And so John is actually teaching right now, but we're going to be watching a recording of his talk, and then he's going to join us after for a live Q&A session. So if you have questions, please write them in the chat or ask them aloud once the talk is over. So I'm gonna share my screen. And let's hope this works. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. At least I presume it was a lovely introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share some of the work that we've been doing in my laboratory uh, for the past, uh, past year or so. I'm going to share my screen now. I presume it's now being shared. And I'm going to show the PowerPoint. Uh, play from the start. Okay. So I'm going to talk about community ecology as a collection of coupled oscillators. Uh, this work, uh, I'll, I'll begin with my acknowledgments. First of all, Zachary and Nicholas and Yvette are the co-authors with me on this. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'll take I'll take responsibility for any of the any of the negative things, and I suppose I'll give all the positive things to them. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the uh, Potawatomi people who uh, originally occupied the land on which we. Uh, are currently uh, are currently situated right now in 1807 was when they were removed from the area that uh, we occupy now uh, forcibly removed and the entire the entire Potawatomi group by 1838 were removed from the last vestige under Chief Menominee uh, where they were driven to Kansas uh, in, <clears throat> in the middle of a typhus epidemic and uh, approximately 50% of the um, those who were moved uh, passed away. So I'll acknowledge the fact that we are on uh, their land. So let me begin with some philosophic, philosophical preliminaries. Uh, there are definitions of objects to be studied and underlying assumptions about how those objects relate to one another are basic to any science, of course. In ecology, we can trace our conceptual frameworks, uh, uh, not to not such a distant past. I mean, we're not physics or chemistry. Um, World War I, <clears throat> post-World War I, was a tremendous amount of interest in vegetational patterns in the colonies of uh, Great, especially of Great Britain. And so we had what emerged from the uh, evaluation of those vegetational patterns, searching for riches that the empire could, uh, could utilize from its colonies. Uh, from that, we got the concept of succession from Tansley and uh, the very idea of, of the ecosystem. Then shortly thereafter, Lacta Volterra, Gauss, uh, uh, Nicholson, and Bailey gave us the dynamical systems, looking at populations and their interactions. Um, then um, I think it was 1947, Lindemann uh, gave us the, uh, the the trophic dynamic aspects of ecology, the throughput systems, flows amongst various trophic levels, and that's turned into our current uh, idea of ecosystems ecology. And then most recently, we have a lot of interest in networks uh, where the objects of stu study are connected with one another in some particular kind of pattern. And so I want to suggest a different way of doing things. Uh, a new paradigm is what I'm going to try to suggest. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this actually uh, was stimulated by a paper written by Platt and Den Den uh, Denman in 1975. There's a two marine ecologists and they noticed some things about, uh, about the world that they were studying. They were sort of mathematical modeling types and they said ecologists like other biologists are involved with the study of living systems and they again like other biologists are handicapped in their work by the inadequacy of the conceptual framework 
to which they must relate their quantitative results and within which the, they must generate new and testable hypotheses. One way in which the weakness of this structure manifests itself is in the lack of a theoretical approach consistently applicable to a wide variety of living systems and able to lead to powerful predictions of high generality. Various such approaches have been tried and found wanting. The exam, for example, the most recent candidate, the systems analysis method, which was very big at the time, requires colossal label, labor and expense to produce a solution that is self-consistent for a particular data set, but for which is guaranteed neither uniqueness in the original data set, nor the self-consistency in any other data set that may be drawn from the same system ensemble, regardless of the boundary conditions. In other words, both the predictive power and the generality of this inelegant approach are very low. Uh, might, that might apply in the present day too. I'm not really sure. We can all think about that. But then they suggest to solve this, what they see as a problem, they suggest most important characteristics of complex systems <clears throat> is that the functional relationships between the system's components be of a nonlinear kind. A crucial characteristic of nonlinear systems is their disposition toward periodic behavior. Now, of course, this is, uh, this is, this is clear to uh, the field of ecology. We have predator prey systems with our classic uh, lynx hair system. And we have various parasitoid systems like the Azuki bean weevil and its parasite, its parasitoid. And then we have microparasitic systems, which we call diseases, I guess, also. All of which are fundamentally underlying principles, by the underlying principles, are oscillatory. So in general, we have beetles like this ladybird beetle and the aphids that, they're, that, that it's going to eat, and that's a predator prey. But then we have herbivore plant pathogen host, parasite host, bacteria, fake bacteria, bacteria, for example. These are all consumer resource systems, which we expect to be oscillatory. So we can imagine this oscill these oscillations as oscillating like a pendulum would oscillate between left and right, from X to P, back and forth. On the left, many prey, few predators. To the right, many predators, few prey. Back to many prey, few pre predators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need equations to, to sort of come to that basic conclusion. Here's an example of, from our work in Mexico. The, the middle picture there is uh, the, scale, the scale insect, uh, the green coffee scale insect, Coxus viridis. And on the right is the, the uh, Coxinella beetle that eats it. Uh, Azaya orbigera is its name. Uh, it also has a disease. Uh, on the right is the same Coxus viridis, the same scale, green coffee scale. Um, <clears throat> on the left is Lacanocilium lacanii. All that pattern that's <clears throat> created with the white fuzzy stuff on the bottoms of those coffee leaves, that's all scale insects that have been covered with Lacanocilium lacanii. It's uh, the disease that attacks it and, and kills it. So we have these two oscillators right, the uh, oscillator with the scale insects and the beetle and the oscillator with the scale insect and the disease. And this is what actually happens in the real world. Uh, we're real world, obviously those predator and prey act together in some way or another. Some places on the farm that we work, we have the beetle and the scale insects that uh, sort of independently existing. Other places we have the disease and the scale insects uh, <coughs> acting, acting uh, separately. Uh, but by and large, it's kind of a mixture, and it moves in, uh, through the system uh, as the year goes by. It's not really all that consistent. Uh, but it is, like Latin Denman suggested, it's obviously a very kind of oscillatory system. Now, <clears throat> dealing with oscillatory systems, one of the things that happens is they tend to become coordinated with one another. Uh, so this is a great exercise. The clapping exercise is really amazing, but I've tried it with uh, a lab meeting uh, of ours, and frankly, it doesn't work online. But I, 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 if, if, you, if you can go to this TED talk that Steve Strogas did, uh, which is indicated by this website here, and what happens is you just go sit and stand in front of an audience and say, and say, okay, everybody, now clap in unison. And that's all, you don't give them any other instructions, and then people just start clapping, and then all of a sudden, uh, very quickly, there's a, people begin clapping in, in, in unison. It's really interesting. It's kind of a collective, uh, general collective behavior. There's no leader that says, okay, let's clap like this. Uh, just uh, the, the clapping becomes, uh, be, uh, the clapping becomes unified. They, this clapping sound uh, synchronizes together. Now here's a, here's a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. This is a video, probably some of you have seen this, but when the Millennial Bridge opened in London, 
uh, why, the first day that it was open, everybody wanted to walk, walk, uh, walk over the bridge, you know? So people started walking on the bridge. And as they started walking on the bridge, a very strange thing happened that you're going to see here. Uh, the bridge begins to sway because there's a lot of people walking on it. You can see the bridge swaying a little, there a little bit. See, there's the bridge, you can see it swaying. And if you now watch the people, the people kind of look like they're actually marching, like in unison, right? And the people themselves are swaying. <laughs> and uh, you, it, it gets even better here in just a second. See, it, it looks like they're planning to walk back and forth like that, does it not? Maybe there's music playing in the background, but not really. What they're, if, if, what they're effectively doing is just trying to stand up, trying not to fall down because the bridge is swaying. So they move to the right and they move to the left to sort of keep their balance as the bridge is swaying. But their movement to the right and movement to the left is actually propelling the bridge to sway more and more and more. So this is a, this is a beautiful example of the synchroniza synchronization of different oscillators. Each one of those people then represents an oscillator and they all synchronize together. Not that they're trying to do, but they do because they're coupled together. Now the classic story here comes from Christian Huygens, the famous physicist who was a, uh, <clears throat> in, in the 17th century and he was the inventor of the pendulum clock and all sorts of other all sorts of other things. But uh, the, the, the story, the way the story goes is he had, he was sick in bed one time and he had two pendulums, well pendulum clocks actually, but he looked at the pendulum uh, sitting on the wall and he noted that they were swinging together like <clears throat> my colleague is going to demonstrate. Her, her, her arms are the pendulum, okay? They were swinging together like this, okay? So he noted, oh, that's interesting. They're all swinging together. So he just got up and he changed them. So he made them swing in opposite directions like that. And then he went back to bed because he was sick and he fell asleep and he woke up a couple of hours, a couple of hours later and sure enough, they're swinging together again. So he did that over and over and over and over again. And the same thing happened all the time. So this, <clears throat> this, uh, this phase connection that they made, excuse me, the, the, uh, becoming uniform in the way they were swinging, that is coordinating their phases, was a consequence of their being on a cement wall, but even on a cement wall, there were sort of vibrations that were going through the cement wall that were picked up by the other oscillator. Now, this is a great experiment here. We have all these pendulum, pendulum here, metronomes here, okay? And each one is, a, is like a pendulum. Imagine that each one is a predator prey system, okay? Going uh, to the one hand, a lot of predators, and the other hand, a lot of prey, back and forth, back and forth, like that. And I just want to uh, watch this and listen to this. Just takes a little bit of time, but uh, it's kind of, if you haven't seen this video before, and I know a lot of you have, but if you haven't seen it before, it's kind of spectacular the way this works. And hope you can hear the sound on this recording. You the sound is an important piece of it. Now, right now, it's just a cacophony. It's like just a bunch of random, you know, random noise. They were all set, you know, they just saw the person setting them there. They were not set in any kind of particular pattern. So, in 32, 32 oscillators, that would be 64, 64 organisms if you think of each lot of oscillator as a predator and a prey or a herbivore or a plant or a or a disease in a host. This is, the way, this is what you would expect from the collective action of all of them together. So, they, they're coming into synchrony, aren't they? You notice the one all the way on the right, in the front, it seems to be in exactly opposite synchrony to all the rest of them, right? Let's see how that works out. There you see it. So, 
what you get is complete synchrony of those things, and they're all just on a platform. If you look closely, if you look at the platform that they're on, you can see the platform swinging back and forth a little bit uh, like that. And that's, that's kind of the key to the whole thing. The oscillators, even though they appear to be independent from one another, they actually are weakly connected with one another. And this is a, this is a, this is a process that works sort of all the time. So what we have in the real world, uh, this is what we have in the real world. These are oscillators that are coupled with one another. Now, do they behave in the same way? And well, the, the, the point of this work that I'm presenting to you today is how can we study how they might work in that, in, in that particular way? Now, um, there's, uh, there's several, several studies, by the way, the sort of, sort of uh, re recent studies that have, uh, have given a lot of credibility to the idea of looking at ecosystems as coupled oscillators. This is one that I particularly like uh, by the uh, Jeff Oisman's group from the University of Amsterdam, where they looked at a marine plankton community, and they were able to tease out particular coupling patterns and, and the, the uh, and the synchrony, the patterns of synchronies that emerged from those coupling patterns that corresponds to exactly what you would expect from the theory. So what we're trying to do is kind of the same thing with the system that we have uh, in Mexico and the Mexico coffee farms that we've been working in for the past 20 years or so. And the idea here is that we understand the system, I think, pretty well. We understand the natural history of the system pretty well from all those years that we've been doing experiments and um, following data, following things through the years and experiments in the laboratory, experiments in the field, et cetera. And I think we understand a lot about the system. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot more to understand, but I think we understand quite a bit about the system. So we have a good feel for the system, like a naturalist, an old fashioned naturalist would get a good feel for the system. Uh, one of the oscillators that exists in, in our system is the coffee rust, coffee rust disease. On the, you see it on the left here. And then on the right, you see the white uh, patches on top of the on top of the coffee rust of these, that's a, the, the lecanocilium. That is exactly the same fungus that attacks the green coffee scale, but it also attacks the, the, the coffee rust. So this is an oscillatory system that goes back and forth. Uh, from our studies, not in Mexico, but in Puerto Rico, we have, uh, we have uh, one particular cycle. This is a 12-month cycle, and you can see the coffee leaf rust plotted against the, le, the uh, lecanocilium, the white halo, the, the fungus that attacks it. As you can see these points, they go from light gray to dark red. Uh, as the time progresses, you can see we have this sort of characteristic uh, counterclockwise spiral that you would expect if this is a predator prey, basically a predator prey system. So now the way I would like to look at this, I get you to look at this as uh, this is sort of a distorted view. I claim this is a distorted view of the underlying thing that's really happening. It looks a little bit more like this or even like this and like this. Okay. In other words, what we want to do is we want to conceive of that oscillatory system as if it were on a circle. Now, <clears throat> predator-prey systems typically form uh, oscillations like this, and uh, one of the things that uh, one of the things that emerges from the models of predator-prey systems is they tend to form limit cycles, and the limit cycles can be represented as a formal circle. Now, they're rarely really circles. Um, but you can always make a transformation to make them look more or less like circles. So you can always have a prey predator system with a circle on a circle like this, which, uh, which goes counterclockwise. And I'll just repeat, I think uh, this applies to all the other consumer resource systems that are so classic uh, in ecology. So we begin with this, with the predator prey system. And then well, we want to try to ap uh, apply this classical model that was invented by uh, the Japanese uh, mathematician Kuramoto uh, many years ago and has been used in the study of coupled oscillators re re rather extensively, at least in the physics literature. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we want to see how, how that can apply to biological oscillators like predator prey systems, consumer resource systems. So the first thing we do is just translate this, take the transformation so that we can look at it so that, uh, that we take the centroid of where the, uh, where the limit cycle was, we translate it to the, to the origin, and we think of the predator-prey system, the state of the system, as an angle on that circular space. Now we want to ask the question, how fast is the angle cha changing? As it's oscillating, of course, the angle is going to be moving to the left. It's going to be going around there, <coughs> around that circle. How fast is it going? Well, the derivative of theta 
uh, with respect to t, then we're going to sp suppose that it's going at a constant rate, omega. Uh, <clears throat> so just just suppose that it's going around. You can imagine it. You can imagine it going around as if it were on a wheel, going around there at a constant rate. Okay. What happens if we have two different oscillators? What will that second oscillator do to the first oscillator? And this is where the curry motor model comes in. And this is the underlying assumption of the curry motor model. Basically says that the rate at which the uh, uh, rate at which the first oscillator will go around the circle, the, the rate of change, is going to be proportional to the phase difference between the two oscillators. In other words, if the, if the two oscillators, oscillators are close to one another, why they'll be the the, the 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 first one will go around at more or less the same rate it went around when there was no oscillator. However, if they're far away from one another, the first one will go around at a much higher rate. Okay, so <clears throat> that's pretty simple. It's pretty simple to intuit what's going to happen there. Not really very much is going to happen there. You're going to go either faster or slower depending on where that second oscillator is placed when you really start the system. However, it all changes when you add a third oscillator. Because in the third oscillator then, you, ask, you have to ask the question is, the first oscillator really responding to the second oscillator or to the third oscillator? And then is the third oscillator responding to the second? But just considering the first oscillator now with that equation down there, well, what you have to do is you have to add that second component to it, the third oscillator affecting that first oscillator. And so this would be the equation to describe the, uh, the rate of change of the, of the first oscillator. There'll be three equations in the system, of course. <clears throat> and uh, just intuitively, if you think about this, why it's not obvious exactly uh, what should happen to these things. Maybe it is to some of you, but it wasn't obvious to me at least. But it becomes even more complicated, of course, as you add oscillators to the system, which is, of course, what we want to do since we're talking about community ecology and how this might affect community ecology. Ultimately, if you have a large number of oscillators, let's say n oscillators, why this is the simple equation that Kuramoto suggested could apply if you have identical oscillators and they're coupled at the rate of k. That is, that k is the is the strength of coupling uh, between any two oscillators. And let, if you let k be constant, that's sort of the simplest way to write the model. Okay, now here's a, this is just a simulation of the system of Kurimoto's system. You can look, this, this is off the web. This is a, a sort of a classic case. Each one of these points is an oscillator now. They're, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're not exactly on the line because they're all on different tracks, okay, as, they were, as if they were runners in their own lanes so that you can see the behavior of the system as a whole. But they all should be on, that one, uh, on the one circle, but they're on different tracks, so you just see them go. So here's the animation now, uh, setting the oscillators randomly I don't know how many there are here. I think there's a hundred, but uh, could be more. So set them randomly on that circle, and this is what happens then when you let the let the model run. <clears throat> Looks like not much is happening. They're just running, winding around the circle, right? But you quickly start seeing some pattern here. They, they you see these clusters form, right? See very very diffuse clusters, and now you see a bigger cluster forming, and now all of a sudden it starts moving pretty fast towards one big cluster and just really relatively quickly what you see happens here, it finally comes to everything is all coordinated. Every, everything is in phase now and they all go around the, uh, <clears throat> go around the circle at the, sa at the same rate. Uh, here's the Wikipedia, this is from the Wikipedia page on the Kurimoto oscillator and you can see exactly how it works. With no phase locking, those just are randomly going around the going around the circle. Uh, they're, they're, they're actually they have different un, uh, different. In this particular example, they have they have different uh, non-coupled rates, but that's not all that important. Full phase locking all the way to the right. You see that they're all sort of phase locked together, and then with partial phase locking, what you see is you see some that are together, but others that really don't tend to uh, don't tend to come together at all with partial phase locking. If you, if you measure how, uh, how phase-locked the system is <coughs> using a, a metric called the order parameter, which, tell, which, which tells you how, how much the phases are locked together, uh, this is a graph of the, this, the, the strength of the coupling amongst the oscillators and, and, and on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the degree of, of, um, of phase-locking uh, with 1.0 being full phase-locking of the whole thing. And what you see 
as you start with a very, very small coupling coefficient, why you don't get much of anything, and then really fairly rapidly, you jump up to almost completely locked. Now, for, for us, what is really interesting, well, of course, this is one of the major results of the Corey-Moto model, which is interesting in and of itself. You have identical oscillators, and you have this, uh, this, this strange thing where you get kind of a critical transition of a critical coupling, critical coupling intensity, which leads to sort of the automatic synchronization of actually all the oscillators in the system. Uh, so <clears throat> what's interesting to us is from, from this point where you begin uh, you begin having some, couple, some uh, uh, cohesion to the system, some phase uh, cohesion to the system. Uh, and then you have this whole area here where you have this, what seemed to be part, what, what, what's indicated there with the partial phase lacking on the left, on the left hand graph. And that's the area where, from our perspective, it seems to be interesting from an ecological point of view. Okay, so we begin with this, uh, this paper that Zach and, I, Zach and I did where we asked a simple question, can the Curry-Moto model reflect what we know the lack of Volterra equations reflect, considering the lack of Volterra equations as you know, historically, relevant, uh, historically relevant approach to community ecology. So <clears throat> can the Curry-Moto model reflect what the lack of Volterra model says? And so we can basically just uh, devise the two equations, pretty simple equations we took the, the first equation, let me go back. The first equation is the curry molar model. And we just said, well, let's take and dis, disembody or disassociate the Ks. And we have the, uh, the gamma, gamma ij represents the coupling coefficient between the ith and the jth oscillator. And then we uh, looked at the lack of Volterra equations. And uh, as probably some of you know, uh, maybe, maybe most of you do, I guess, you have two different qualitatively qualitative ways that you can couple these equations you can imagine that a consumer the consumer one and resource one consumer two and resource two are coupled by virtue of the fact that the two resources are in competition with one another or you could couple them by virtue of the fact that the c1 and c2 themselves are in competition with one another because they're eating each other's resources but at a much lower rate than they're eating their own resources so these two definite pattern, these two distinct patterns of coupling actually give different results in terms of what the time series gives you, provided they're weak couplings. As, they get, as the couplings get stronger, why they go chaotic and everything like that. But with weak coupling, what you get are these patterns. With the resource coupling, with the resource coupling, what happens is you, if you begin with a system in phase oscillating, what happens is very, very quickly, they go out of phase and they become anti-phase phase connected. Uh, on the other hand, on this, the second example, when they're coupled by the resource connections, why you, if you begin them anti-phase, why they rapidly go into phase. And so <clears throat> what we decided to do was look at this from the point of view of the, of the, of the Kurimoto oscillator. So if you think of that, a Kurimoto graph, we can graph, we can make a graph indicating what the Kurimoto model would do here where one, one with a little circle represents the first consumer resource system, two represents the second resource, consumer resource system, and the coupling uh, between the two R's should result in the anti-phase anti -phase diagram, and we indicate that by a negative coupling between one and two, whereas in the in-phase expectation, we indicate the degree of coupling as a positive coupling between one and two. Okay, this gives us all of the possibilities, these are all of the possibilities, all the qualitatively distinct possibilities that we can get from uh, a, a, a three oscillator system. That is, you know, six predators and six prey uh, using these four possibilities. So you have uh, in the top one, for example, you have the, well, to take the bottom one to start with, where you have all the C's are connected with the R's and so C1 eats its own, but it also eats the, eats, eats the C, C2's resource. C2 eats R3, eats its own resource, but it also eats R3's resource, et cetera, et cetera. So this would be one, two, and three. Those three oscillators would each have a positive connection. The next one up, the second from the bottom, is just the exact opposite, where the connections are made amongst the three oscillators only through the resources being in competition with one another. And then you go right up down the, uh, up the line so you see all four possible combinations. <clears throat> and so what we expect from these combinations would, is, uh, is you, you can see what we expect from the combinations 
on the right hand side the, the, uh, of this graph here, <clears throat> you can see the time series. In the time series, you see what the results are from putting the lockable terror equations together with this, these particular arrangements. And then the Kurimoto diagram, which is shown all the way to the left, you can see it gives you exactly the same results. So what we have, maybe I better get my um, laser pointer going here, if I can. So, um, so what we have down here, if you can see my laser pointer, what we have down here where everything becomes coordinated, in phase coordinated like this, the Kurimoto diagram gives us this, in phase coordination on the circle, obviously. In this particular case, where we have complete anti-phase coordination, uh, <clears throat> which is what happens when you have this, this situation right here, why what the Kurimoto model gives us is perfect anti-phase correlation. That's the best you could do. Uh, each one occupying a third of the way around the circle from itself. When you have uh, this situation here, where two of them are expected to be out of phase and one and and one one pair in phase, what you get is exactly that. Um, the the <clears throat> these two are in phase and they're both out of phase, the anti phase associated with this one. And finally, this odd situation actually where. Uh, one and two are trying to couple with one another, one and three are trying to couple with one another, but two and three are trying to be antiphase with one another, and you get this particular arrangement out of the Curie motor model. Uh, this is the time series from the lack of all their equations. It's exactly what you would expect. Uh, let me briefly mention one other article. This is by uh, Giron et, et al., uh, looking at the synchronization of multiple oscillators. They were looking at at uh, n equals 500 oscillators, so that's a thousand species they're looking at here, connected uh, by uh, resource, and cons uh, resource consumer connections. And as you can see here in the in the Kurimoto formulation that they have here, they disembodied or dis dis <coughs> disassociated the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the the coupling coefficients so that you have different different coefficients. And what what done here? What they've done here is a two separate matrices one with just positive coefficients and one with just negative coefficients. Everything else is all sort of set up at random. And their results are, if you look at the, the results on the, on the circle space right here, uh, this is with no coupling and they're just all, all, all around. Each, each oscillator has a different color coded somehow or another. And then with a little bit of oscill uh, with a little bit of coupling, well, with substantial coupling, what you see are two basic groups here. Uh, and the two groups themselves are anti-phase coordinated with one another, but in-phase coordinated with one another. As the coupling gets larger, why the phase, why the, the couplings just get stronger, and the uh, <clears throat> the phase coordination becomes stronger also. But still, you get this: all the positive ones are in synchrony, and they're out; they're in anti-phase synchrony with the ones that are negative. So we have these two. Uh, disaggregated coromotor approaches that work theoretically. Now the question is, can that give us any insight whatsoever into what might happen in a real system? This is the real system that uh, I'm talking about. And as I said before, we've been studying this system for a long time now. And I think we have a good idea, possibly not all that quantitative, <clears throat> but I think we have a really good deal sort of as like old fashioned naturalists of exactly how this system works. What are, what are the, you know, what are the underlying overall patterns that we have in the system? So the idea is to try to use the Kurimoto approach to see if what we would find from Kurimoto corresponds with what we actually know to be the case in the system. Here's a different diagram of that exact same system. I'm putting this diagram up here because this diagram emphasizes the oscillators that are in the system. Each number represents a predator prey or disease host uh, uh, op operation or a, parasit a parasitoid operation also. Uh, so we expect each of these to be oscillatory. Note, I'll just point out very quickly, number 22 here, oscillator number 22, is we, we connected with a, a dash line and that's because uh, oscillator 22, we're not really sure if it's, a, if it's as strong as the other ones are. So we're kind of using it because we understand that it's, uh, we understand something about it and we know that it has a variety of values that it could take. So we're kind of using oscillator 22 to probe the system a little bit more. That will be, mo that will be clear uh, right at the end when I get to the end. Uh, you see in part B over here, this is, a, this is just a regular graph of the system. You can see all 22 oscillators. 
and the way they are connected together based on the idea that if elements of the oscillator are connected with the other oscillator, that means they're connected. So these are all the connections from the, that you have up there from one through 22. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what we get then when we put the, put the model operating, and we just simulate, it on, simulate the model on the computer with just these connections. Now, remember the Kurimoto model is all connections all together. They're, that was the idea, but what we're doing is we're disaggregating the Kurimoto model, and we have only these connections in the Kurimoto model. Uh, so we get something, we get things like this. This is just one example of one result that we get. In this result, what you can see here is that we have, we have one, two, three groups that are clustered together. That is, we're calling these synchronization groups. Uh, so, so for example, uh, oscillator one, two, and four are synchronized together. They're up there, they move around the circle as, as one unit. Uh, oscillators five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 also are synchronized together and move as one unit. And likewise, 14 through 22, they do the same thing. So there's actually four groups <coughs> And one that never, that one that doesn't connect with anybody else, right? Now, uh, <clears throat> this corresponds to, I, I, I can't actually remember if I said this already, but if I uh, did, excuse me, but I'll say it again. Uh, what we have here is just like we have in the curry motor model as, you see, as, as we see it all over the literature, we have synchrony groups, and then we have elements that don't synchronize, or at least not very easily. Uh, those are right, frequently referred to chimeric elements, and when you have um, when you have a system where you have uh, several groups in synchrony that make a pattern, but then once they refuse to refuse to synchronize, those are that's, that's the whole thing is called a chimera, and these chimeric elements are the ones that won't synchronize, and that's what we had in this partial phase locking down la uh, locking down here in the in the Wikipedia model. You can see there's a group right here, a group right here, a group right here, a group right here, and a group right here. And some of these other ones, they just wander around and they can't really get, uh, get uh, they can't really synchronize with anything. Those are called chimeric elements. So in our particular case, oscillator three, uh, right here, the one that the arrow is pointing to, oscillator three would be at this level of coupling would be a chimeric, chimeric group. Now let me show you the dynamics of how this particular set of synchrony groups and one chimeric element emerged. This is a graph of the thetas over time. Now remember, theta ranges from zero to two pi. So the fact that you get those rapid drops is not really interesting at all. It just happens to be you're going from two pi down to zero because you, you made it all the way around the circle, right? <coughs> Excuse me, so what you can see here is these groups are forming. Uh, uh, at this point right here, you can see these three are together, one, two, four, and they stay together as you go through time here. Uh, up here, these form really very quickly, 14 through 22, right up here, and they stay the same all through time. Uh, same with uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 down here, but then they kind of converge with 10, 11, 12, 13 as you, get, uh, as you get out here. And so this is the pattern over time that happened in order to give this particular pattern on the graph that you have here. Okay, uh, another way of looking at this is looking on the, in the circle space itself. And so at this point in time right here, this is the pattern that you get with one, two, three, four synchrony groups and that number three, which is, which is chimeric. And then you follow this in time and I've, or, I've or, oriented these so that you can follow the synchrony groups. As you go through time, they become more clustered together, but the chimeric element remains. Here they're very clustered together. All these are all these are the three of them, and that chimeric element remains itself. Okay, so the idea is you have synchrony groups. Now, the last thing I want to point out to you is what happens with these synchrony groups and how they how they dynamically change over time. So what we have here is a graph of on the x-axis. I've just listed uh, one one through twenty-two all of the oscillators that we have. And then I'm going to show you what happens as we change the value of k. The k is the average coupling coefficient, okay? And each coupling coefficient is the same. It's just the pattern of how they're coupled, which is what changes. And then on the top there, I've, I've indicated the groups that we know exist in nature. So to what extent does the pattern that we get out of the, Kimura, uh, the, the Kuramoto model correspond to what we actually know exists in, in nature? So if we start very low with very low coupling down on, 
uh, y is close to zero, the first thing that happens is very quickly, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, they, <coughs> they uh, emerge, they, they form a synchrony group. But at that value of k, nobody else ever forms a synchrony group. Everybody else, all the other oscillators are effectively chimeric elements. Only 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 form. As we increase k, we get a little bit further and we get this, now the same synchrony groups, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, that group, but we also now get this group over here between 11 and, tw uh, 11 and, 11 and 12, that's another synchrony group. This one right here. Now, as we increase k a little bit more, what we get all of a sudden right here at this value, a little bit less than 0.5, all of a sudden the scale insect subgroup, some of the scale insect subgroup starts converging to be synchrony groups. So at this value of k, now we have partial, some of the, the organisms in the scale insect subgroup, some in the rust fungus subgroup, and some in the berry borer subgroup that are now synchrony groups. Increasing k further, what we get now is the other element of the scale insect subgroup comes together to join it to be a synchrony group. Uh, we have a new synchrony group that is, is part of the leaf miner subgroup uh, that forms a synchrony group. So you can see these synchrony groups are forming uh, just according to the logic of what we claim to know about the biology, the ecology of the system. Uh, here, note number 22 has joined this group right here, and now we have one fairly large synchrony group here. Now further, at this point, now we have three, three synchrony groups. The leaf miner subgroup has joined up with the berry borer subgroup, and here the rust fungus subgroup, I think that's the whole thing right there, and then the scale insect subgroup is here, and then at this point, when we get fairly high, why this so-called forest subgroup suddenly forms and synchronizes, and at this point, we have one, two, three, four different synchrony groups, and finally, then, the rust fungus sub subgroup merges to the, with the, the rust fungus synchrony group, merges with the scale insect synchrony group, and we get one, two, three groups, but note that oscillator number three, oscillator number three, is still a chimeric element. Finally, uh, when we get full coupling, why everything couples together and you get the com complete coupling, just like you do in the regular current motor model. <coughs> so that's pretty much what we get. If you look at uh, this point right here, uh, this is where we have, now you'll see these, we have one, we have four synchrony groups, right? Uh, I lose my laser all the time on my screen here. But you can, you can all see the four synchrony groups, can't you? I know you can see my laser, but I can't. Well, anyway, so you have this group here. This group, the, the forest subgroup. You have the scale insect subgroup and the rust fungus subgroup. And, and then the rump, rust fungus subgroup. And then you have this group of the leaf miner and the berry borer, which are, form one uh, synchrony group, okay? So at that point, then, as we increase K, the, uh, those very rapidly go to complete synchrony. So now the question, we want to ask is what, uh, what happens if we now sort of manipulate number 22? Because number 22, remember, could be either, uh, could, be, could be the same as the other ones or could be much less than the other ones. So this is that, these are the four synchrony groups looking at the, uh, the, the diagram that I showed earlier. Now, if we have strong coupling with 22 or weak coupling with 22, what happens? With strong coupling with 22, this is the last two that we get before complete synchrony. If there's weak coupling with 22, this is the last group, this is the last two group situation we have before we get complete synchrony. <coughs> so as you see, it does make a difference, perhaps not a big difference, but it does make a difference in the end uh, what the particular value of the uh, coupling coefficients are. Now all of the other coupling coefficients are equal. Uh, they all are equal to whatever that K was that I was showing you earlier. Uh, so, uh, in the end, uh, this is sort of the, the general framework that we have, uh, and I'd like to say something about the structured current motor model like this. I mean, there are advantages to it. I think there are advantages to it. Um, we have, we can gain, it seems that, I mean, the evidence that I have here is that we can gain a qualitative understanding of whom eats whom, we, excuse me, we can gain some kind of understanding from only a qualitative understanding of who is whom. That's all that's necessary. It's like food web, food web theory is sort of the same thing. Uh, we need minimal uh, imagination or pretending to know that we know, to pretend that we know the parameter values. 
there's no, no assumptions about stability of parameter values. They can be quite variable. Um, and it predicts correlations that can be searched for in the field. Um, and maybe uh, it's a new method for envisioning community structure. That is, we look for synchrony groups and chimeric elements as uh, sort of the definition of what community structure is in community ecology. Uh, those are advantages. There are disadvantages, pretty obviously. Um, uh, there's, any hidden oscillators could be very important, and we don't really know that until we find them. This, I would argue, is not all that unique to the Kurimoto system, but uh, it could, it, it, like any other system, this could be important. Then something that we know to be the case in the system that we have, these complex super nonlinearities uh, in the system, which we have been ignoring in this particular study. We know they're important, but we've been ignoring them so that we can directly apply the Kurimoto model. Uh, they add considerable complexity to the whole thing. And then there are many unknowns, like what is the effect of variable K? What about negative gammas, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, finally, uh, <laughs> Trevor Platt uh, passed away last year, and in a later paper, uh, he said, while a considerable variety of problems has already been tackled, the number of published applications is still very small. The surface has barely been scratched. We expect with confidence that the next 10 to 15 years will see the development of the field of spectra spectra spectroscopy of the ecosystem. The identification, which is to say, the identification and interpretation of periodicities in ecosystem behavior. The rate of expansion of the field will depend on whether and how fast a nonlinear oscillator representation of living systems is accepted as a new paradigm for theoretical biology. And here I am uh, saying that um, <laughs> at least part of my lab is following the lead of Trevor Platt uh, <clears throat> in, this, in this endeavor. If you're interested, uh, you can find this article by myself and, and Zach and Nick and Yvette uh, is on the archives if you want to look for it. And, uh, Everything I said today is in that article, <coughs> uh, only perhaps explained better than I, than I am now explaining it. So that's that, and I'll, I'll see you in person. All right, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Oh, and there's John. And I wasn't sure if that was actually you, John, or if that was so <laughs> I guess maybe all your speakers tell you this, but it's been super fun. I really enjoyed um, chatting to everybody here. It's been a really, really fun department. Oh, I'm so sorry. Really, um, yeah, still like the research here is so exciting. Sorry about that. All right. So, all right. Let's start with Aaron. If you want to so, unmute yourself. Thanks. So thanks, John. That was a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, lots of interesting concepts there to think about and very uh, visionary, I guess. Um, but so I wondered if you had, uh, you, you could talk to me about this aspect. So um, you sort of postulate in the model that there is, uh, a, a, that the interactions t tend to synchronize groups of species. Um, but when we think about um, species extinctions, Synchrony is, is one of the main forces that leads to extinction of, of groups of species, right? Because of these oscillations, when they synchronize, get larger and, and take uh, groups of species down uh, closer to, to low densities. So, uh, you know, that's at least one example of a sort of evolutionary scale force that might work against this. Uh, I wonder if you've thought about that and, and whether there are other evolutionary angles that, that deserve to be considered. Yeah, uh, uh, very obvious points, uh, and th thanks, for, thanks for the question, Aaron. Uh, remember, this is a unique, very unique system in that we're dealing with basically one trophic level. It's all the, the, the plant here, the, pr the primary producer is just coffee. So we can make, kind of make an assumption that things ought to be synchronized with one another. In a, in a system which is more complicated, and if we had more, um, more plants in the system that are competing, the expectation is that some of those K values, some of those coupling coefficients will be negative, not positive. So it's not true that in general, this approach would require things to be become synchronized like that. But in general, it will be sort of a mishmash, mishmash of 
in, uh, reverse synchrony and in phase synchrony, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And how the, the ones that are reverse synchrony will interact with the ones that are going towards synchrony. I think that's a question that needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be posed. And I don't know what the answer to that question is. Uh, on the other hand, the, the way we are conceptualizing this system is these oscillators are at points in, at, at points in space. And so a lot of the connections are from one point in space to another point in space. And uh, the way they become, the way that they become coordinated will then have, uh, will then show up on the landscape as sort of, as sort of a lumpy landscape where you have a, a coordinated group here, but then it will have disappeared from this next area, but it will be coordinated here and disappeared from this next area. So in that conceptualization, I think it's perfectly fine that they coordinate and because they're coordinated, they go extinct. But the extinction process is operating just at that local level. So that's what, that's, that's what I would say. All right, your next question, John, is from Catherine. And she says, what determines K in nature? What's determining K in nature? Uh, well, First, let me say that uh, one, of the, one of the assumptions of this whole thing is that the, that, uh, that coupling should be relatively weak, okay? So as we're going from zero to one, we're actually talking about relatively weak coupling, coupling all, uh, all around. And what determines K in nature is the various demographic parameters that, that exist in the, in the system. Now, we're talking about, in this particular model, we're talking about predator-prey systems, or well, disease, host, predator, prey, but consu consumer resource systems. So what determines the K there is the degree to which those two, those various systems are connected together with one another, where it's the predator eating the wrong prey or the disease attacking the wrong organism or something like that. I think in, the, in Trevor Pratt's way of looking at it, why the K is a much more nebulous, nebulous idea, and you just have these oscillators, the nonlinear oscillators that are going that are, that are in the ecosystem, that are creating the structure of the ecosystem, and what's causing them to be connected at some particular level of connection depends on the particular system and the particular drivers of what those oscillators, oscillators might be. So I don't think there's a general answer to your question, Catherine. In our particular system, I think it's general, and that is uh, the, de the demographic parameters of the consumer resource systems that are there. And our, you know, our I, assumption that they're all equal, obviously, is a ridiculous assumption. We know that they're not all equal, but, you know, we get, I, frankly, I think it's pretty impressive that making that very, very generalized assumption, even though we know it's not true, it gives us results which are very, very um, consistent with what we know about the system from our natural history, of, our natural history knowledge of the system. Well, John, I'm thinking of that um, figure where you showed the increasing values of K and more and more coupled systems emerge and then some of them merge with each other and such. So I'm wondering, would you be able to get to the point that if you knew the demographic parameters adequately, you could predict which systems would emerge and then which would merge together? I guess those are some of the things that were motivating my question. And well, there's, Catherine, there's no question about it. If we knew the demographic parameters, yes, we could say that for sure. I mean, part of, this, part, of the, part of the idea here is that, uh, part of my idea at least is that we're trying to be able to look at systems and understand them without knowing those demographic parameters. Uh, and, and this is not that different from what a lot of the food web literature is about. Uh, just knowing that this thing eats this thing and then some other thing also eats that, we know something about it. And knowing just that, is there anything that we can say about it? And I used to think, frankly, when I used to criticize food web theory, I used to think, no, there's not much we can say about it without knowing what the parameter values are. But since trying to deal with the Kurimoto model and you know, kind of hanging out with Kurimoto for a while and trying to apply it to a system that I feel that I understand pretty well, I'm pretty impressed with the way the model can uh, you can kind of replicate certain aspects of the system the way I know it to be. And then Luis kind of had a follow up to that. Is this kind of analysis of clustering as you increase K typical? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I, 
I, I guess I would presume it's typical, but uh, the, you know, I, frankly, there haven't been a lot of studies like this. I think I, I cited one of the other ones that, uh, that has taken the same approach that we've taken. Um, and yes, indeed, that does seem to happen in the other one. I expect that it will happen. Um, but I don't, but you know, I don't know. It's going to take uh, people to people to study other particular other particular systems to see if it really does happen. I don't see why it wouldn't happen. And what might be the biological interpretation of turning up K? Well, the biological interpretation would be again depending on the context. In our context, it would be uh, increase in the consumption rates or increase in the in the growth rate, uh, in the conversion rate of the various consumers that are, that are in the system, something like that. Uh, but if we want to go more general, of course, it would depend on what the particular oscillatory systems are that you have. Okay. And Mitchell Newberry is asking, I wonder if this relates to Lev Ginber Ginsberg's ecological orbits. I'm um, sorry, I don't know. I, okay. I mean, I know Lev Ginsberg, but I don't know the ecological orbits. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, he, he wrote a book called Ecological Orbits um, that I think kind of deals with these topics of like coupled cycles. And uh -huh. I've been kind of curious about algebra, like how, you know, if, if individual interactions are made of these uh, coupled oscillators, how do they actually relate? So this talk has been really fascinating. Um, yeah, and I guess I just was wondering if you'd seen that book. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, but I now that you mention it, I'll look it up. Thanks. Thanks for the. Okay, I don't know if it's good. I just yeah. <laughs> All right, and Mark Hunter asks mutualists, not indirect effects, but real mutualisms where A is positive with B and vice versa, and C eats B. What happens? Um, okay, the, the the honest answer, Mark, is I don't know. Uh, but the uh, <clears throat> but the question I thought about the question and um, in our in our current work why we're trying to add things like mutualism in addition to the indirect effects we're trying to add mutualisms into the whole thing. If you take strictly the consumer resource system that I showed you in the beginning that uh, the first one where we com combined it with the Lac de Volterra system, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, there's no no reason for not having uh, a connection between the two consumers that would be a mutualistic connection. Now that would change the expectation of what the very simple curry motor model would, uh, would suggest that you're supposed to do with it. And frankly, I haven't really resolved that in, even in my own mind of how that would work. So that's clearly a, that's clearly a huge, uh, a huge hole in the whole thing. Okay. A few more questions here from Jonas Wickman. In the Lotka Volterra example, oscillators were specified so that each species belonged to precisely one oscillator. But in the coffee example, each interaction was an oscillator so that a species could belong to many oscillators. How to decide what the unit of analysis is? Uh, well, <clears throat> the Lotka Volterra example, for, in my opinion, that was just to sort of convince ourselves that at least the way this one relatively well-known system, the Lac de system, that it, sh it, it shows us something about the way phase locking happens, the way phase locking happens as a consequence of coupling the oscillators, and then that the Curry-Moto model, when you formulate it in that way, uh, that it will produce exactly the same results. So that's just as kind of a comforting fact that that, that happened to turn out. Um, in terms of the real system, uh, it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a good question. I mean, we uh, we just take it as the particular species that are involved in the coffee system that we're working with. I mean, there are really clear units when you're talking about the pests. Those four different pests are pretty clear. And then the one, the things that attack those pests, that's uh, probably less clear in that um, some, of the, some of the elements that we have in the system obviously are collections of species. Other elements are particular species. And uh, the question of how we decided to do that is uh, um, basically through some, what I regard as a legitimate qualitative understanding of way, the way we think the system works. Maybe that's not uh, satisfactory for 
you know, really good hard no science, but that's actually, that's what we do. Okay, Michael has two questions. The first one, theoretically, I think you need a specific model structure and parameters to get oscillations. Empirically, only less than 50% of populations tend to oscillate. For example, Kendall 2002 EL. What if only some of the populations tend to cycle? Well, <clears throat> the system that, that we have is like most other systems, it's very difficult to see oscillations even if they do exist. I mean, I'll go with, uh, with, the, with the original uh, Trevor Platt and I can't remember the other author, uh, what they, they sort of intuit, and I believe in that intuition also, I believe that the fundamental nonlinearities in the system suggest that there's going to be a lot of oscillators. Um, you know, you look at the, the, any system that we know that it oscillates, even laboratory systems like Huffaker's famous experiments or even the Lynx hair cycle. I mean, we know that there are oscillations there, but um, once you, if you look at them with foggy lenses, they start looking a little bit non-oscillatory. The fact is that if you're gonna have a consumer resource system, the underlying fact of a lot of predators view prey going over to few prey and a lot of predators. And it seems to me that's an underlying logic that in the same sense that a pendulum goes back and forth, um, a pendulum in a, in a, <clears throat> on a jiggly base probably wouldn't oscillate very much, but it's still fundamentally an oscillatory system. And I do believe that, uh, and I'll argue this to my dying day, I think, that the underlying structure of consumer resource systems are fundamentally oscillatory and even if they don't realize those oscillations in the real world. All right, the next question from the same person, Michael. What happens if environmental stochasticity kicks the oscillators in various directions? Uh, there's no such thing as environmental stochasticity in the, in, in the real world. That, that was a joke for Aaron. That was the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, Keep coming in. Well, that's a, you know that's a, that's that, that's a hugely important question, and um, and I certainly don't know the answer to it, but I, I but I do know that incorporating stochasticity very frequently enables us to sort of tease out what underlying dynamic underlying deterministic dynamics are in a system. Aaron has a, actually a marvelous paper that he published many many years ago, pointing out how this actually happened in that tribolium system that he used to study, and so. Uh, on the one hand, the stochastic forces from, from nature are going to make everything very, going to make everything sort of uh, looking at it all through foggy lenses. I know that. But on the other hand, if we're clever about it, uh, we can use the stochastic forces, if we understand the stochastic forces, to tr try to help understand the underlying deterministic forces, which I presume at least are operative in the system. So that's, uh, well, that's my answer. Thank you. All right. Jim asks, have you looked at effects of adding size structured populations, juveniles versus adults? <laughs> no, but that's a really great idea. Um, I've been talking to Matthew Leibold about, about this. He, 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 he caught our paper on the, on the archives and he's all excited about it because he has in his system why he has uh, oscillators, he has predator prey oscillators in an experimental system, but then he also has demographic oscillations. So you go with, uh, you know, with clodocerins, you have, uh, you, you do have these fundamentally oscillatory, oscillatory features where going from, you know, from baby, from juvenile to adult, uh, that's kind of an oscillation in and of itself. And when you get sort of, uh, sort of an, uh, an imbalance in the whole thing where the eggs are produced and then the adults are produced, et cetera. I'm not explaining this very well, but you do have oscillations that are caused simply by the demographic, demographic uh, parameters. And so what he's interested in doing is taking the Kurimoto approach and adding sort of another completely different kind of oscillator and asking how that might, uh, that might inform his, uh, his, uh, might inform his understanding of his own experiments. Uh, yeah, I think that's um, certain that could be exceedingly important and uh, something that I would love to consider. All right, last questions from Veronica. 
How do you select K if you don't know too much about the system in advance? Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, the way we've approached it is we didn't really select K. We just sort of, you know, we looked at all of the values of K from zero to one, that is, which is, in a, in a sense, is all the values of K. And the whole idea was to look at the, the overall structure of the system as it changes, as you, as you change from, uh, as you, as you change the value of K. And, you know, things, things emerged from that. You get a, you get a structure, not to say that that structure exists at any one particular value of K, but you get a structure of the way that particular set of oscillators is expected to behave. So you have synchrony groups, but the synchrony groups may not be real outside in nature, but they might be real at some other level of the coupling coefficient. Then you have these chimeric elements, which I think is super interesting. Some, some, th some things that even though they're, they're connected, partially because they, you know, they sort of can't figure out which group to synchronize with, they stay chimeric through the whole thing. Understanding, <clears throat> understanding those pieces of the system, to my mind, is a, you know, another way of understanding community structure. You're not making very, very precise predictions, and that certainly isn't the goal of this whole thing, but you're trying to develop a, a, you know, a, a framework which enables you to uh, understand at a very qualitative level how the, how the system's stuck together. I would like to say, and since nobody asked the question, I'll ask the question, uh, what happens when you have these nonlinearities in the system? And that's something that we're working on right now. And that turns out to be super complicated, and it's not exactly, First of all, it's not exactly clear how you incorporate those typical nonlinearities into the uh, into the Kurimoto framework. Uh, but we've made some strides in that direction. Well, I think there's strides in that direction. And the results that come out are super, super interesting. But uh, you'll have to invite me for another seminar so I can uh, tell you about that. OK, there was a second part to this question. That was, how do you determine pairs if you don't know your system in advance? I'm thinking from a big data perspective when we work with larger systems, more noise, et cetera. Well, a, a part of the, yeah, that, that's a good, good question. I'm part of the, part, sort of part of the spirit of what we're trying to do here is, uh, <clears throat> I think it's combining knowing something about natural history and knowing something about ecological theory and sort of, combining the two of them together. I don't, I'm not really suggesting we have a recipe here at all, but uh, I, I hope it's evidence that we, we were kind of bouncing back between sort of abstract theory with the Kurimoto model, but also with the reality of a system that, you know, we, we've been working on for a long time now, so we feel we have a good understanding in the, in the spirit of an old-fashioned natural historian. We understand pretty much how that system works, uh, <clears throat> combining those two things together is the is the that's the framework that we're looking at here, and we're trying to look at uh, you know, qualitative understanding of the way the system works, not in any way sort of getting down to precise predictions of how it works or anything like that. 